Um, today my sermon is titled by grace through faith by grace through faith so i'll be preaching on the topic of salvation but mainly i want to talk about uh, just some questions and some maybe some objections and issues surrounding the topic of salvation that i just want to reiterate to the church today by grace through faith that is how we are saved now the first point in my sermon is you may not know uh, and this this may come as a shock if when i say this there are two ways to be saved are there there are two ways to be saved and we read about this in the bible that there are two ways to be saved uh, in ephesians 2 we know one way is by grace through faith and by grace for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of god not of works lest any man should boast because what's the other way to get saved the other way you can get saved is you can do it by works but the problem is doing it by works is impossible this is why the bible says we are saved by grace through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of god not of works lest any man should boast because there was there the one one way to be saved was that you kept all the commandments but because it's impossible to keep all the commandments this is why the bible saying it's not of work because it's impossible to do it that way it must be by grace through faith galatians 2 16 the knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law so you see how one way the only way for salvation that is possible is that we believe on the lord jesus christ it's by grace through faith so grace is an unmerited favor it's obtaining god's favor through faith without doing something yourself without doing the works of the law and keeping the commandments so one way is grace through faith the other way is the works through the law right by works of the law but by the faith knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law but by the faith of christ even we have believed in jesus christ that we might be justified by the faith of christ and not by the works of the law for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified and i tend to tell that to people out soul when i say hey there there are two ways to get to heaven the problem is one way is impossible so you're only left with one option so there is only one way we can get to heaven but there were two ways in order to be justified but one way was impossible now it's important to understand this because when you read through the old testament you read through the gospels like we did today in luke 18 there are going to be passages and times when the other way to salvation is being alluded to but what we understand about that other way to salvation which is by the works of the law is that it is impossible to do but you need to understand that it is there it is a truth it's just that it cannot be done but this is why we have passages like luke 18 and we're going to look at the other time where jesus talks well the other mention of the rich young ruler in mark 10 and we'll get a bit of insight into what he is telling the rich young ruler here so sometimes people are tripped up when they come to passages like this or there are statements from jesus or statements in the old testament that allude to a works-based salvation and you need to understand because that is a truth it's just it's impossible to do so don't get tripped up by this and this is why often the conversation or the discussion between salvation by grace and salvation by works there's so many passages to go to because it's there it is there in the bible right where the bible says hey you know well you adulterers and murderers shall not inherit the kingdom of god you know people that sin and the wages of sin is death so people will go to these passages showing hey well if you don't keep the works you're not going to go to heaven and that's the problem none of us can keep the works that's why we need to be saved by grace but even a passage like this if you see what is going on here you'll see that jesus is actually alluding to salvation by grace he's not actually teaching a works salvation here in mark 10 so this is the parallel passage to luke 18 with the rich young ruler and when he was gone forth into the way there came one running and now we know from luke 18 that this is a ruler that came to him this is why he's known as the rich young ruler 
and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So notice, he's alluding to the things that he does, right? So these are the two, your two options, right? Either it's what you do or it's what Jesus does. What shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Now first Jesus addresses the, how this rich young ruler has addressed him, saying, Good master. And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. So what is he trying to tell the rich young ruler? He says, he's saying to him, do you realize that you are acknowledging me as God when you call me good master? Right, so that's what he's saying to him. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. Now what, notice here when he goes over some of the commandments. Which commandment is missing? Because he, he mentions a few of the Ten Commandments here, but what are the ones that are missing? There's the first few, right? Have no other gods before me, don't have any idols, keep the Sabbath day holy, and it's honour your mother and father, things like that. But what's the one missing? Thou shalt not covet. I don't know if you've ever noticed that in the rich young ruler. When Jesus is saying, keep the commandments, he mentions a few to him, but well, which one does he leave out? Thou shalt not covet. So you see how we know here as Jesus is talking to him. Jesus obviously knows that salvation cannot be earned by well, Why would Jesus come to die for the sins of the world? No, he's going to pray in the garden and say, is there any other way let this cup pass from me when he's just going to teach everyone, yeah, just, just keep the commandments and go to heaven. Now obviously Jesus is saying these things to make them think because this rich young ruler is coming to Jesus thinking that he is going to justify himself and get himself to heaven by works. So Jesus mentions to him, well, you know to keep the commandments? He answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth up. Now that's a pretty, that's a pretty big uh, claim, but let's say we give that to him. Let's say he hasn't committed any of these ones. But has he kept all the commandments of God? And look at verse 21. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him. <laughs> Doesn't that remind you when your kid, like maybe a child comes to you and they say something very ignorantly and you just behold them, just, you know, marveling at their ignorance, right? It's a bit like Jesus here. He's probably looking at the rich young ruler and just thinking, wow, you know, this person really does think he's righteous in his own eyes. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. Now people have often taken this response from Jesus to say, hey, this is what it takes in order to be saved. But is this what's going on in this story here? Is Jesus actually telling the rich young ruler, hey, go and keep all the commandments and then you'll be saved? No, what Jesus is doing here is he's realizing that this rich young ruler is trying to earn his way to, way to heaven by works. So he is referring to the law to reveal to him, no, you have not kept all the commandments. You cannot get to heaven by works. And then what does the rich young ruler respond to? He was sad at that saying and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. So you see how Jesus is trying to make him think, make him realize, no, you are not worthy to earn salvation by works. And Jesus looked around about and said unto his disciples, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? So this is what he said in Luke 18. But here we get a bit more insight. Because it's not that God is saying, hey, in order to get to heaven, you have to get rid of all your riches and therefore you'll be saved. What is he saying here? Well, the disciples were astonished, right? They were surprised at his words. But Jesus answered again and said unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that, look, trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. Why? Because people that are successful, people that have a lot of riches, tend to start trusting into the things that they do rather than what God did for them. How many times have you seen rich people, even on, on the television, say, you know, I did all this myself. I worked hard and I did this and I, I built this business, I built this empire. You know, I did it all myself. Nobody helped me. They get that sort of attitude, don't they? And this is why it's very difficult for people that are successful to trust somebody else because they've had to do everything themselves, not realizing it was God that gave them the power to get that wealth. 
It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure. What does that say? They were astonished. You can't even measure how much they were astonished. That's what that saying is saying. Saying among themselves, who then can be saved? So you see how they're saying, whoa, if, you have a, if a rich man can't get himself to heaven, if somebody that's doing this, it's impossible for them to get to heaven, and they're capable of so much, who then can be saved? And look at what Jesus says, And Jesus, looking upon them, saith, With man it is impossible. So you notice that in this story, did Jesus was Jesus actually telling the man to keep the commandments to go to heaven? No, he recognized, hey, with man to be saved by their own righteousness is impossible. But not with God, for with God all things are possible. And who did he just, who did he just claim that the rich young ruler was calling God? Right? Himself. So notice that it all comes together. So why, but why is it right? Why is it right for Jesus to say things like this? Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not steal. Because if you could keep the commandments, you could be saved by that. So this is why you see passages like in the, this in the Bible, because the fact that the old covenant of keeping the commandments to be saved, it is a truth. But the full truth is, well, we are sinners. We cannot keep the commandments, and that, why, that is why we have to be saved by grace through faith. Look at Luke 10. This is another time where Jesus is asked from a lawyer, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? He answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbour as thyself. So this is a different angle now, whereas before with the rich young ruler, they're mentioning a few of the Ten Commandments. Here, the lawyer is mentioning the two greatest commandments, to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbour as yourself. And look what Jesus says. He said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. So should we read this from Jesus and just go, Ah, Jesus is teaching a work salvation. Technically, is Jesus teaching a work salvation here? Yes. But is that what he's saying? This is how this person is going to get to heaven? No. Because this person has not kept those two commandments. Because look here in verse 29. But he willing to justify himself said unto jesus and who is my neighbor and then it goes on to the parable of the good samaritan how the samaritan took care of the one that was you know uh, was uh, uh burgled or robbed right and, and left to die and he takes him to the to the inn and pays for him so i want to just give you some insight there make you understand hey salvation is by grace through faith we talk about saying, hey, there's only one way to, to be saved because there's only one way that is possible for us to be saved. But the Bible actually talks about two ways to be saved. So don't get tripped up when you read passages that say, hey, keep the commandments, be blessed of God, keep the commandments, otherwise you're going to be judged by God. The wages of sin is death. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Keep the commandments. Why are they there? Because there is that way to get to heaven, but nobody can keep it. That's my first point. Now I tend to, this is just a soul winning tip, but this is the part of the plan of salvation when I'm preaching the gospel to somebody where I'll emphasize the two types of salvation, right? It's either trusting Jesus, believing salvation by grace through faith, or trusting in your own good works. So usually this is at um, part four of the five points where I go through the plan of salvation. The first one, you know, we've all sinned. Second, there's a punishment for sin. Three, Jesus Christ died for our sins. And then number four, you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And I take them here. I say, like, you know, there's a question in the Bible. It's point blank. That was asked of the Apostle Paul. What must I do to be saved? And here's the answer in verse 31. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. So when I get to this verse normally in the plan of salvation, I'll mention this. Because a lot of people read, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And they just think it means that, you know, I, I know about Jesus. I know what he did. I know what he's capable I believe what he's capable of. He's capable of saving me. 
as opposed to trusting what he did in order to take them to heaven. So sometimes I'll mention to people, and this might help you in your soul winning, because I find when I explain this point, it really helps it to click in people's mind that they're not actually trusting Jesus, even though they claim to believe in Jesus. And I'll say something like, well, when you read that, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you may be thinking to yourself, well, I already believe on Jesus Christ. But you remember when I asked you at the beginning, hey, what do you think it takes to go to heaven? You said, well, it's because I'm a pretty good person, it's because I don't do that many sins. So you notice how your first reaction was not, hey, what Jesus did for me. It's actually what you were doing. So when somebody answers the question, what do I have to do to get to heaven? They think, well, I've been a pretty good person. You notice how they're actually trusting their own works. They're actually put their trust in themselves and thinking, hey, I need to get myself to heaven. This is why I need to be the best person I can in order to get there. But when the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that trust needs to transfer from what that person is doing to what Jesus has already done. So that's what I explain to them. Say, hey, you see how that's what you said? You're actually trusting in your own works, but you have to trust the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And generally when I get to this point and I've explained that to somebody, usually it clicks in their mind, like, ah, yeah, even though I say I believe in Jesus, I'm actually trusting my own good work because I'm thinking I need to get myself to heaven. Even though I know Jesus is the Son of God, I know he died on the cross for my sins, I know through him that's the only way I can have eternal life. And yet when I think about how I'm getting to heaven, I'm thinking I have to be good enough. So it shows that they have not yet believed on the Lord Jesus Christ as opposed to just knowing about who he is. So believing on the Lord Jesus Christ is not just knowing about Jesus, it is that is what he did, what you are trusting to get you to heaven. And that's the one way that is possible for us to be saved. All right, my second point is, and this is an important point, that you can't mix grace and works in order for something to still be grace. You know, a lot of people will say things like, well, yeah, I know Jesus died for my sins, but I have to do my part. Now, why is it so important that you can't mix these two methods of salvation, right? You either have salvation by grace or you have salvation by works. You can't mix the two. It's either one or the other. Well, in Romans 11, look at what it says here. If by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. What is the Bible saying here? You can't mix the two because once you put a little bit of works into grace, then that's not grace anymore. That's not free anymore. It's like if I said to you, you know, I'm going I'm to give you a gift for free. You know, I'll give you this pouch for free. But it's going to cost you a dollar. You say, oh, it's not free anymore. Even though maybe this cost me $10 to buy. Even if I give it to you and I say, I want 10 cents, you say, oh, it's not free anymore. That's what this verse is saying. This verse is saying, hey, you have to do one work in order to be saved. That's not grace anymore. And you can't mix the two methods of salvation. It's either all grace or it's all works. This is what people don't realize. You can't say, well, I just do my part. And people will say, well, doesn't it help? It's got to help at least. You know what? It'll actually help you to go to hell if you believe you have to do a little bit in order to get yourself to heaven. Look what it says here in Galatians 5. Galatians 5. This is a really important point that we make people understand. And that's why people will say, like, oh, it's, it's so, you make it so easy to go to heaven. Well, you know, it's either easy or it's impossibly hard. Take your pick. It's not somewhere in the middle. Because if it's by grace, then it's no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. Galatians 5. Behold... What was happening in the Galatian church? People coming in saying that you needed to be circumcised to be saved. Right? And this is how Paul addressed this topic. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. You see how people say, oh, well, if I get baptized, if I'm going to church, I'm sure it helps. I'm sure it, I'm sure it gets me a little bit of the way there. No. It's either Christ is everything for salvation, or it's all you. Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised. So what is he addressing here in the Galatian church? People trying to be circumcised to be saved. Right? I testify again to every man that is circumcised. Look at this. That he is a debtor to do the whole law. 
So you see how you can't just do part of the law and Jesus does the rest. Either Jesus does it all or you have to do it all. This is why it's impossible. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. So you can't mix grace and works. It's either all Jesus or it's all you. That's why it needs to be all Jesus. And it's very simple. It's very easy. Thank God for that, because if it wasn't, it would be impossibly hard. All right. All right, number three. I just want to get into some issues here. I don't want to spend too much time on salvation, because for a lot of us here, it's very clear. But you need to make sure you're very clear on salvation. Salvation is not by works. We just have to put our faith on what Jesus has done. Right? Once we put our faith on what Jesus has done, we are saved forever because Jesus has paid for all our sins. Now, a couple of things I want people to understand. Is salvation by faith alone, or is it by grace alone? Because people will say, like, oh, you know, because salvation will say, oh, it's by grace alone. But then they also say, well, salvation is by faith alone. Now, both of these are true. Salvation is by faith alone, and salvation is by grace alone. But I want you to understand we, when we talk about salvation, right, we are comparing like the two methods of salvation, works or grace. It's not works or faith, right? I want you to understand that those are not the two types of methods, right? It's not works and faith, it's works and grace. But why do we make the statement it's by faith alone? Because when we talk about how to receive the grace from God, the one thing you have to do is just to believe, right? Just have the faith to receive that grace. So this is why the, the statement that we are saved by faith alone is not incorrect when we are talking about the method in which we receive the grace. That's why the salvation is by grace through faith. Because faith is the vehicle by which we receive that grace. As opposed to what? As opposed to receiving the grace by works or by sacraments because some there are religions out there you know the catholic church is one of them the mormon church is another that teaches that you get grace they believe they will say salvation is by the grace of god but the question is well, how do you receive that grace oh well in order to receive the grace you need to take communion you need to get baptized you need to confess your sins to the priest. You need to be, you know, go to church and you need to try and live a good life. And this is the way, through these sacraments, you receive this grace. So this is where the statement comes from, where we say, no, it's by faith alone, because it's not by sacraments, it's not by works of the flesh that you receive that grace. You receive the grace purely by faith alone. So that's why the true statement, the full statement is, we're saved by grace through faith. So the Catholic Church thinks of it that way, when you, when you sort of delve into a Catholic, because that's why, because you, you, you kind of get thrown off because a Catholic will say, no, it's salvation's all the grace of God. Well, what they're saying is, because that eternal life, it's all provided for by God, it's all paid for, but then how do you get it, yeah. is the problem. You get it, they, they say, well, get baptized and do all the, keep good commandments. So it's like, wait a second, that, that's work salvation. But that's why they say it's by grace, but the grace is received through the sacraments. Or you might talk to a Mormon, or like a, even a Jehovah's Witnesses, but I've heard this as well before, and, and I, I, I don't know all the different religions that think of it this way. But they'll say, yeah, salvation is by grace. But they'll say the grace of God just enables you to then keep the commandments so that you can work your way to heaven. And it's just like, what? So it's like you couldn't, because, because without the grace of God, you couldn't even hope to be able to keep the commandments to get yourself to heaven. But now that Jesus Christ has died for you, the way they think of it, God has given you the grace to enable you to keep the commandments so that you can now be faithful unto the end and get yourself to heaven. So you see how they really get around. So I just want you to understand that's what it means by grace alone and why we say by faith alone. Now, the other important thing to notice, now, wh why, why do we say faith alone when we talk about salvation? So you'll notice outside, one of ours is we're saved by grace. But the reason why we say faith alone is because that's how we receive the grace. 
Now, why is that important to understand that when we make the statement faith alone, we are talking about the method in which we receive salvation? Because where it will confuse you is salvation by grace is by faith. But do you know that the works we do as believers is also done by faith? Right? So we, uh, we receive grace by faith, but we also keep the commandments by faith. And this is where people get tripped up in the Bible and they think, well, it's by faith alone, it's by faith alone, it's not a works, but then you start seeing passages in the Bible like the ones I'm going to show you, right? So Colossians 2. So you need to realize, when we're talking about receiving salvation, we receive it by faith. But when we talk about keeping the commandments of God, we also keep the commandments by faith. So this is why the Bible can talk about keeping the faith. Be grounded in the faith. Don't depart from the faith. Because what is that? That's not talking necessarily about departing from salvation. right? That's just talking about you not departing from keeping the commandments of God through faith. Right? But there's also the faith it takes in order to receive salvation. Colossians 2, look at this. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord. So how did we receive Christ Jesus the Lord? By faith. So, so in the same way you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith. You see, so that's why passages like this exist, because not only are we saved by grace through faith, we also walk in the commandments of God by faith. As ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. 2 Corinthians 5, Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. So the statement by faith does not only apply to salvation, it also applies to keeping the commandments of God. But when we make the statement, well, we're saved by faith alone, you've got to understand, the statement is in relation to how salvation is received. It doesn't mean we don't believe that it also takes faith to keep the commandments. But it also, it also doesn't mean, I'm getting confused with my negatives now, like, we don't believe that the faith it takes to walk in God's commandments is what's required for salvation. Because when we say it's by faith alone, it, we're not talking about the faith it takes to believe God's word and walk in his commandments. That's not what it takes to be saved. The faith it takes to be saved is a faith to trust Jesus and receive the grace from God. So don't be confused with these terms because sometimes people that teach work salvation, they do this little switcheroo on you. And you're like, hey, it's by faith, but... It is faith, right? You walk by faith. It's this faith that takes to be saved, by faith alone. So that's where you'll get confused. So don't get confused. There's the two. Receive grace by faith. We walk by faith. Romans 1. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. So the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection. It's the power of God unto salvation. Why? To everyone that believeth. So you see there, you receive that grace, that power of God unto salvation through faith. To the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. Look at this. From faith to faith. Like we saw here, as ye have received Christ Jesus the Lord, how did you receive him? By faith. So walk ye in him. And that's why in Romans 1 it says you go from faith to faith because the first faith is receiving the grace and then the faith to walk in the Lord. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. So faith was only in regards to salvation. Why would passages like Romans 14, 23 exist? And he that doubteth is damned if he eat because he eateth not of faith for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So what I'm trying to make you understand here is that when the Bible talks about faith, it's not only talking about salvation. It's just talking about belief in God in general. Yes, there is a portion of salvation or the salvation is received by faith, but we also keep the commandments by faith. Number four is, 
And these are not necessarily related, or, and the sermon is not necessarily flowing on one from another. I'm just addressing issues around salvation, just talking about them. Now, what about believe in versus believe on? Is there a difference when the Bible says believe in and believe on? Now, I believe, this is, this is my position on this, that these, these are synonymous sayings, right? That there are no difference. But sometimes when the Bible uses a, a, a wide variety, the King James Bible uses a, a variety of vocabulary, sometimes people try and find nuances between the two. And sometimes there is. I'm not saying there isn't always. But sometimes it's just a different way to say the same thing. Maybe it sounds better and whatnot. But I don't think there is a difference between believing in something in the Bible and believing on something. Because sometimes people will draw the distinction, and I've heard this um, before from many people that I've been with, before. I've heard this in Arizona as well uh, from somebody that preached there, saying that, no, well, believe in. They'll say, well, when you believe in something, it's just accepting it as truth, but not putting your trust on it. And then that's why the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Because it's like, then it's putting your trust in it. Now, that sounds good, but that, I don't think, is actually the truth in the Bible. And I'll, and I'll show you why. But one thing here is, this is where the thought first started when I first heard it many years ago in John 3.16. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him, you see there, they'll say, in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. And they'll say, you see, should is like, well, because somebody who accepts the facts, right, and believes the facts, should, will probably then have a lot, good chance of believing on Jesus Christ, and then this would be then, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So I don't think there's actually a difference between should or shall, but I'll show you in a moment. So they'll say that. They'll say, see, believing in as opposed to believing on. So you say, that's why it's believing in here. You should not perish, but have everlasting life. But look at John 11, verse 25. It says, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. So you see how it's not just when you believe in something, it should and may be saved, maybe not saved, depending if you take that next step. Because here in John 11, Jesus is saying, well, you believe in me, yet shall he live. So it's a definite thing. And whosoever liveth, look at this, and believeth on, no, in. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die, believest thou this. So you see how some people think that there is a more, like when it's believe on, it's more definite, believe in, it's less definite because it's like, hey, maybe you're just accepting Jesus in your head, but not your heart, or you're accepting Jesus here, but you haven't yet put your trust on him. I don't think that's the case. I know people have said that before, but I just don't think there's a difference. So you can see here, here's an in with should, here's an in with shall, in me. Not only that, John 6, so here we go. Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But look at John 12. I am come a light into the world, and whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. So all I'm saying here, and maybe you've never had this thought before, but this thought is out there where there's a difference between believing in Jesus and believing on Jesus. I personally think when you compare all the verses, it's just used interchangeably, and I'm not too sure why the translators chose one over another. Maybe, maybe one just sounds better than others, because you've got to remember, when the King James Bible was translated, they didn't just translate it accurately, they also made it a work of art. They made it sound good as well. So this is where, where there are synonyms that might be, have alliteration or might have the same sounding word or may have a certain rhythm to it as well. They took that into account too. And this is why the King James Bible sounds so beautiful. So I just want to address that point there, just a little segue. All right, number five. Calling upon the Lord. This is something I want to address and just to reiterate. Calling upon the Lord. Now, is it required to call upon the Lord, ask the Lord, request of the Lord salvation in order to be saved. I believe, yes, it is. It is a requirement to be saved. And I want to I explain how I understand the nuance in difference. When we say the difference between believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and calling upon the Lord, I believe is the same thing. Right? Calling upon the Lord is the act 
of believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. When I believe on Him is when I call upon Him in faith. But some people believe that believing on the Lord Jesus Christ is something different to calling upon the Lord. And they, then they get this idea was, well, when you just believe, you just have to believe something, and then you have salvation, but calling upon the Lord is just voluntary, it's just something extra. Let's go to Romans 10. Romans 10 says, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon Him. All right, so this is talking about salvation here, offered to everybody. Verse 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now as we read, we see the steps back from salvation, right? So you're saved because you call. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? So you see, you believe something first, which then enables you to call on the Lord, which then enables you to receive salvation. And how shall they believe in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So the question is, what happens between calling and believing in him for whom they have not heard and how shall they hear without a preacher so there is a step there of you hear something you believe something you respond by calling upon the Lord and then you are saved if believing here was the point of salvation without a calling upon the Lord why would he need to include this step here? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It should just be then, how, or whosoever believeth on him should be saved. And then, how then shall they believe on him in whom they have not heard? It should just go straight into there. But no, Paul mentions these steps because this is how salvation works. Now let me try and explain it to you this way. This is how I understand it, right? When people think of the word believe they think it is believing the facts about something and that is true right when you believe something you're saying hey i believe this is true but that's not what i think it's talking about when the bible talks about believing on the lord jesus christ it's not just believing his ability to save you right and some people think that's what it takes to be saved they think that's the point of salvation when I accept the truths about Jesus and I accept that it's true, that's the point that I receive eternal life. I don't think that's how it works. The way it works is, yes, you believe the truths about Jesus Christ. You believe that he's able to save you. But the point at which you get saved is when you call upon the Lord in faith to receive that salvation. So I could think about it this way. This is just sort of off the top of my head. But let's say Elizabeth had this pouch right and you ask me victor does elizabeth have the pouch and i'm like yes is she able to give you the pouch if you ask it from her of course she will give she's not she will not lie you know she's not a liar she's offering it to me i know that she has the pouch she has the ability to give the pouch and if i ask for the pouch i will get the pouch do i have the pouch though no, I don't have the pouch at this point. So you see how I think people mix up believing on the Lord Jesus Christ with just believing his ability or his capability to save you. But when, the reason why the Bible talks about calling upon the name of the Lord and in Matthew 7, ask and you shall receive, because it's believing she has the pouch, believing she will give me the pouch, but when I, the point at which I get saved is that by grace through faith, I call upon the Lord, I say, can I have the pouch? And then I get it. So this is why people sometimes, I think, get confused about, well, if it's just faith, why do I need to call upon the name of the Lord? Well, because calling upon the name of the Lord is how you exercise the faith that you have in Jesus to actually receive the gift through faith, right? That's what you are actually calling upon and what you are requesting. And this is why in Matthew 7, it says, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receiveth. He that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you whom if his son asks bread, will give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, 
how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good gifts, give good things to them that ask him? So the way we receive eternal life is by asking it of the Lord, but we ask in faith. So where people get, like I said, I hope this is not confusing you, but this is where I think people get confused. This is where I was confused. Because I thought, hey, you just believe the facts about Jesus. You believe in his ability to save you. So it's almost like, imagine if like Elizabeth still had this pouch. And, I, and it, people think it works this way with salvation. They think, so imagine this is with, with Elizabeth. And it's like, ah, yes, Elizabeth has the pouch. And she can give it to me. And at that point, it's like, boom, it's yours. That's how people think salvation works. And how when it says, believeth in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. But that's not how I believe it works. The way I believe it works is, yes, you acknowledge she has the pouch, but you say, Elizabeth, please give me the pouch. Then you get it. Okay? So that's why I believe calling upon the Lord is necessary. Because that's how you interact with God, to say, God, save me. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You ask of your heavenly Father, or you ask of God, save me, and then that's the moment you receive salvation. And I hope that clears that up a bit. All right, number six. What if I stop believing? People ask this question. What if I stop believing? Am I still saved? Now, because salvation is a point in time, the point you receive salvation, you have salvation. So the question is not really, what if I stop believing? The question is, have I ever not believed? But if you have believed, you have received salvation, therefore you will never lose salvation because you already have it. Now the thing about this question of what if I stop believing, the reason why people ask this question is because they think you possessing salvation is not dependent on that point in time in which you called upon the Lord and received salvation. They think salvation, your having salvation is dependent on the state of your faith. I'm in a state of belief, I have salvation. I'm no longer in a state of belief, I no longer have salvation. I believe again, I have so I've got to keep believing, because if I stop believing, I'm not going to have it anymore. That's not how salvation works. Salvation is you receive it. You call upon it in faith, you accept it, now you've got it. So why is it not dependent? Because think about your Christian life. We talked about it already. Your faith fluctuates, doesn't it? Sometimes you have days where you're full of faith. Other days you have days where you're not full of faith. Man, if salvation was dependent on the state of your faith, every day, multiple times a day, it'd be like, you wouldn't be having it. Getting it back, having it, getting it back, having it. It's based on the state of your faith. So it's not, when we say salvation is by grace through faith, it is not the state of your faith. It is that moment in faith where you call upon the Lord and you get it. And that is a one-time thing. So even if you stop believing, hypothetically, even if somebody hypothetically, you know, stops believing, it's by grace. That's possible too. That's what was happening in the Galatian church. And Paul was saying, man, I'm, I'm doubting. whether He was worried about them. Right? Because they were getting sucked back into work salvation. That happens to people here. People get sucked into you know, living waters and all that stuff of like, oh, repent and forsake your sins. You know, otherwise you're not truly saved. And people you know, listen to all those sermons on the internet and then they start thinking, oh man, like, I better start living right, otherwise I won't stay saved. But they're actually saved, but they're just getting sucked into a false gospel. That's what's happening in the Galatian church. They're getting sucked into a false gospel of you better be circumcised, otherwise you're not saved. So it's possible. It's possible for a believer, saved believer, to, to accept heresies. Right? This is why we have to cleanse ourselves from the filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit. But that's not how salvation works. So don't be concerned. If you have accepted the Lord, you've called upon the Lord and received salvation, you have it. Right? Because you have eternal life. And even if you have lapses in your faith, you will still have salvation. 2 Timothy 2, look at this. It is a faithful saying... For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he, will also, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. Now I've included the whole passage here. Usually people just look at verse 13, just to talk about this point of if, we, if you stop believing, are you still saved? Because it says, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. But what may trip you up 
when you're showing this to somebody, is they say like, well, let's read the verses around it. And you go, well, verse 12. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. So does that mean like if I stop believing, he's going to deny me? What do I think this is talking about? Well, if you read it in the context, and this is why I've got suffer and reign here, what is, what is being denied here? If we suffer with him, that's saying if you're willing to stay, take a stand for Jesus, like Peter wasn't when he said, hey, we know you, you were with Jesus. And he's like, I know not the man. But if you're saying, no, I, some people have not recanted, right? Even though they're saved, they didn't recant. They stood, but they suffered with him. You're going to get rewarded. We shall also reign with him. Because this is one of the rewards you get. Right? When you suffer, you take a stand for Jesus and you suffer, you will be rewarded with authority over 10 cities, whatever. If we deny him, right? So what are you denying him? You weren't willing to suffer with him. He also will deny us. So what are you being denied here? Rewards. Reigning. Who's being denied? He will also deny us. So when God says he's denying something I'm requesting, right? Let's think about that for a minute. Well, I'll check this air con. Is this blowing hot air? Who's being denied? You're being denied. But when it comes to salvation, if we believe not, even if you have a lapse in faith, yet he abideth faithful. Why are you still saved? Is it because of your faith? No, you're still saved because of his promise. He abideth faithful look at this he cannot deny himself so why are you still saved even if you stop believing god will deny you rewards but why are you still saved even if you stop believing because god can't deny himself because he has promised eternal life he's promised that he will save you forever he has promised i will never leave thee nor forsake thee and if he does, he's denying himself. And he can't, even if you stop believing. I hope that's a good thought to you. Now, this one is a quick one. Um, sometimes I've been tripped up on this before. So I'm kind of sharing with you things that have tripped me up. Um, I don't think ways I've learned to respond to them. And hopefully it helps you. Sometimes you'll hear people say this. I don't really have any verses to go with this. This is just a point I want to share with you. People say, well, if you... They'll say things like this. Well, if you believe something then then you will change otherwise you don't really believe it and in a certain extent that's true because people say well if you believe something is bad for you if you really believe that you would stop you would change there would be a change in, the, in what you do so they'll sort of liken that to to salvation right and they'll say like well if you really believed in jesus christ you will keep the commandments and that sort of sounds right at first when you don't think it through but then i remember thinking it through and thinking wait a second but I don't believe you have to keep the commandments to go to, to, go to heaven. Like, I don't believe that's what it takes. So, so why would that change when that's not what I'm believing in order to be saved? What I'm believing in order to be saved is that it's all Jesus. And I do believe that. So that did change. So when people say, well, if you really believe something, it would change. They're right. If I really believed Jesus was able to save me and it's all Jesus, I would put my faith on Jesus. But because they're thinking, well, you have to do works to get to heaven. If you really believe Jesus, you would do works, therefore there would be some change in your life. But remember, that's not what we're believing it takes to get saved. So whether or not I change in my works is irrelevant to whether or not I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I don't want to confuse you too much, but that's something I've been thinking about and I wanted to share with you, number seven. All right, number eight. I've just got two more. Is grace a license to sin? Because people will say, well, if you just teach people that they're saved no matter what and all it takes to believe, you're just letting them live however they want. Right? You're just saying, oh, just go and live however you want, you're still going to heaven anyway. And what people are confusing, they're confusing the fact of even if you sin you're still saved with it is okay to sin what we're saying is even if you do something not okay you're still saved but that doesn't mean what you're doing is okay and that's when we talk about you know, we can liken it to children 
or you can liken it to a marriage. Right? Even if you treat your husband or your wife poorly, does that mean you're no longer married? Does that mean you just do whatever you want? No, because there are consequences to that. So it's the same with salvation. Yes, even though you do wrong, are you still saved? Yes. Why? Because Romans 5.20 Moreover the law entered that the offence might abound. What is this saying? The more you know about God's law, the more you realise how sinful you are. So as you're growing in the law, you don't think I've got less and less sins. As you grow in the law, you start realising the multitude of your sins. Right? So this idea of you know, just getting less and, more, less and less sinful, you know, it, it's actually the opposite when you're growing in the law. Because as you grow in knowledge of God's law, you grow in knowledge of how short you keep discovering more and more sins that you realise that you're doing. But where sin abounded, look at this, grace did much more abound. So grace always abounds more than the sin that you are committing. But what people understand from that, because they're so ingrained with work salvation, they think, well, does, it, does that mean it's okay to sin then? Because, they, because they're so you know, ingrained that, hey, in order to get to heaven, I have to be good. So therefore, if I'm doing bad and I'm going to heaven anyway, they're equating that with all oh, that bad thing that I'm doing must be good because he's letting you go to heaven. And it's like, no, because you're not going to heaven because you're good. Right? You're going to heaven because you're forgiven. So that's where people confuse it. And it's because they think it's good that gets you to heaven. So they're saying, oh, if you're telling people to do bad, you're making that good. No, we're just saying, even if you're bad, you will go to heaven anyway. But does that mean you have a license to sin? To mean like, hey, you should live however you want? No, because Romans 6.1 says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Is that what we should do? Should we just continue to sin because grace will abound? That no and notice, if you continue in sin, grace will abound. That's why he asked the question: should you keep sinning so that grace abounds? Because grace will continue to abound. But what is the answer to that question? God forbid. So no, you shouldn't just keep sinning to let grace abound. How shall we that are dead to sin? live any longer therein so people will still be saved even if they sin and we're not saying just because you go to heaven even if you're bad you'll still get and, and newsflash guys everybody that goes to heaven doesn't keep the commandments right we all get to heaven by the grace of god all of us come short so if we're going to say, hey, you didn't keep that, you didn't keep that, you shouldn't get to go to heaven. You know what? It's going to condemn all of us because none of us have kept the commandments. So when people say, oh, you know, you tell people that, you're just going to give them a license to sin. Well, what would they rather? Would they rather us just tell them a lie and then send them to hell rather than tell them the truth and explain to them how it works? No. People, people are used to hell being a motivator for why you do good works right and that's why in their mind when you take away hell out of the motivations to do good they then their mind is bold they're like well have you ever heard people say that well if they go to heaven anyway why do anything good as though, as though there's no other reason to do good works other than to save yourself from hell no but there are there are reasons to do good works other than just to save yourself from hell but people struggle sometimes with salvation by grace because for their whole life they're taught that's the reason why hell exists because it's the motivator for you to do good works so once that's taken out of the equation they're a little bit lost and they're like well why why do anything good why don't just live however you want because you'll go to heaven anyway well here are some reasons to not sin and this is the last point one is Earthly consequences. Earthly consequences. Say so you go, hey, well, I'm going to go to heaven anyway, so let's just live however I want. Well, then you go out, you hang around with the wrong people, you go and commit adultery on your wife, you go and take drugs and go sleep around, and we'll check back with you in five, ten years and see how you're doing. You know, there's definitely consequences. You ruin people's lives, you'll ruin your own life. You know, even people that are successful aren't as happy as you think. You know, like every, every day, I mean, I was, I was just watching actually, uh, this, guy, this guy wasn't necessarily living a really bad life, but I was just watching a live stream recently. Um, 
from a guy called Linus. I don't know if, you, if you're on YouTube, maybe you've come across a guy called Linus. He does Linus tech tips. He's kind of a guy with a squeaky voice. <laughs> maybe <you've> seen. <laughs> Peter's nodding his head. If you're into sort of tech gear, I'm sure if you've looked up some review on some item, I'm sure you've come across a video of Linus tech tips. Anyway, he did a live stream recently saying like he was thinking about retiring because he just realized it was just too much and just he just realized you know he, he didn't know how much he wanted to be part of this consumerism industry of like making people cover just to want the latest gadgets and everything like that because he's actually quite a minimalistic person and he had a, an encounter with somebody who was dying at 12 years old because he's part of like make a wish foundation just change his perspective perspective on life and what his values were he's been neglecting his family he's been neglecting his children and it just made him reflect on that and i just well, it was a very touching live stream. I've, I've only just seen him as this really happy, you know, guy doing these videos and stuff. And then when they actually pour their heart out, you realize sometimes these people are not as, not as happy as they say they are. Because there's consequences to sin. There's consequences to your actions. And that's why it's not just, well, I don't want to go to hell, therefore I don't want to sin. You know, a big motivator of not wanting to sin is you don't want to ruin your life. You don't want to ruin other people's lives. That's number one. Number two is heavenly rewards. We talk about this, you know, when we talk about New Year's. You know, you have so much life to live. You could use your brief life of 70, 80, 90 years to live for yourself, live how you want, live in sin. When you go to heaven, what are you going to have? What are you going to have to show for it? When you stand before God and your works are tried, what's going to be left? That is a motivator. To, do, to use your life for something meaningful. I mean, and we have the earthly wisdom to put money away, don't we? Don't just squander it all, put it away for a rainy day, build things that have at least lasting value in this life. You, know, you think about when you build a business or you build a house. I mean, you're not just building your house of, hey, are you like the, the silly little pig? You know, you're the pig that built the house. You know, you build things to last. You say, I'm going to put this in my house because it's not going to break easily. Well, how are you building a spiritual life? Right, that's one good motivator for why you want to live right. So you can get the maximum amount of rewards in heaven. Number three is fatherly chastisement. See, is there a certain fear in living in sin? Yes. But is the fear going to hell? No. But what should we fear? We should fear being chastised of the Lord. A heavenly ch discipline from our heavenly Father. Just like our children ought to fear getting disciplined from us. We ought to fear being disciplined from God. So that's another reason not to sin. And the last two is, you know, a love for others. So if you want to do things that are right by this, then you'll do what's right. You won't want to sin. And lastly, a love for God. We want to please our Heavenly Father. If you are grateful for what God has done for you, you're grateful for salvation, that is a motivator to do good works. And some people, they, they don't understand that yet. They just think, well, if you're going to heaven anyway, why do you do this every week? Why do you go out every week and knock the doors? Why do you serve God? Well, it's because it's, I'm not, because we don't have the fear of hell anymore. So what is it? There's obviously other reasons to serve God. That's why there's consequences, heavenly rewards, fatherly chastisement, a love for others, to do what's right by others and not to ruin other people's lives. And lastly, a love for God, a sense of gratitude for what God has done for you. All right, I hope that sermon was a blessing for you. I know it was a jumble of a lot of things, but I hope you learned something from it. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for your love for us, Lord. Thank you that no matter what we do, we have eternal salvation. Thank you, Lord, that even if we believe not, you will abide faithful because you won't deny yourself. We thank you, Lord, for that assurance. So help us, Lord, to be motivated for the other reasons we talked about today, Lord, to serve you with what we have. Uh, so we thank you, Lord. Help us because we are a weak people. We always walk in the flesh. Help us, Lord, to walk in the Spirit. And help us to be faithful. And we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.